Welcome back to Salem Lutheran Church and School in Afton, Missouri. It's Tuesday morning, 10 a.m. Central Time, and time for our Tuesday morning Bible study. My name is Pastor Wayne Heatner, and with me this morning is Mr. John Whitmere and Vicar Brett Jones. They'll be in the balcony throughout the hour and helping me field your questions and comments from home. We want to welcome all of you who are watching this morning's Bible study on Facebook Live and those of you listening to the audio stream of today's study on our telephone ministry. Unfortunately, we don't have an in-person uh, Bible study group today. The uh, restrictions that have been set forth by our county, St. Louis County here in Missouri, at this time at least, are uh, interpreted as prohibiting in-person Bible study, at least for a short time. Uh, we're going to take this week and do everything online and then reevaluate next week and see how things are going. As you know by now, the pandemic has upset just about every facet of our everyday lives, and we continue to live day by day, trusting in God's grace and praying that he will bring an end to this uh, pestilence as soon as possible. But we are here this morning and we have God's word to engage us once again. And today we have our hands full, don't we? Because we're at chapter 11 of the Old Testament book of Daniel. Hang on to your hats because we've got a lot of ground to cover. And uh, as one of my professors used to say, this is tough sledding uh, going through Daniel chapter 11. But we'll see how the Lord leads us and pray for God's Holy Spirit to guide us. So let's go before him in prayer at this time. Dear Holy Spirit, we ask that you open the hearts and minds of all who are participating in today's study. Open our eyes of faith to see Christ Jesus, our Lord and Master, the one who has redeemed us from sin, death, and evil, and the one who will defeat all the enemies of your church we pray that you keep us strong in our faith in Christ. Uh, help us continue to trust and believe his promises and not waver or doubt uh, during these difficult and challenging times. We pray for our church and school. Keep us faithful amidst the attacks of Satan and his allies. Uh, let us proclaim Christ faithfully in our community and to our world. And we pray that this Bible study would be done to the glory of his holy name. Amen. All right, well, let's uh, talk about where we've been and where we're going. We are in the closing weeks of a study on the Old Testament book of Daniel called God's Faithful Prophet. We went through some of the earlier chapters, which are more narrative or storytelling chapters, uh, familiar ground like the three men in the fiery furnace, Daniel in the lion's den, and so on. The last chapters of the Old Testament book of Daniel record visions and prophecies from this man of faith in his elderly years as he was a kind of elder statesman both in the kingdoms of Babylon but then later among the Medes and the Persians. When we get to chapter 11, Daniel is also looking ahead at what will come after the time of the Persian Empire to the days of the Greek kingdoms, first led by Alexander the Great, but then a long and complicated history over a period of a few hundred years in which uh, kings come and go uh, the way traffic passes each other on a busy street. At least it seems that way. And to complicate matters, many of the kings took the same names and only the Roman numerals change in the uh, history books that we have recorded. There's also a section at the end of Daniel 11 when our attention is turned to the days leading up to the end of the world. And it's an appropriate time of year for us to do that as we are in the last two weeks of the Christian church year. Looking ahead to what uh, is coming for the church and for the world, we are introduced to this lawless figure who is often called the Antichrist, and we'll see what Daniel has to say about him and how the church has interpreted, interpreted these Bible passages down through the ages. It is a challenging chapter of the Bible, 
And if you get to the end of the hour, about 11 o'clock, and you're like me and you say, what was it that we just studied? I think that's okay. Uh, God's Holy Spirit will work through these words, again, to bring us to Christ Jesus and confirm us in our faith in him. That's what all of scripture is about. And so if we leave the hour with that message in mind, even if we don't get all the historical details just right, I'm sure that will be okay. All right. Uh, for those of you who are watching at home and participating in the study on Facebook Live, we invite you to log in, let everybody else know that you're here, and don't forget that you can send in your comments or questions uh, to the church, and uh, Mr. Whitmayer and Vicar Brett will field them and relay them down to me. They have a microphone up in the balcony, and I'm standing here live in the lectern at Salem Church. Uh, maybe you have some impressions on who or what the Antichrist is. Have you heard things in your background in the church about how these passages ought to be interpreted? If you'd like to share some of your thoughts or maybe the questions you have with us, please do so over Facebook Live. Now, we are using a, uh, a particular study guide that we've been following one chapter a week. Now we're up to chapter 11. This was written by a Lutheran pastor and a series of vicars that he had back in the 1980s. And I mentioned that at the time that much of this material was being prepared, uh, probably the most uh, helpful Lutheran commentary on the book of Daniel was written by a scholar named Leupold and that was done in the late 1940s. Uh, it's a helpful book. It has many uh, redeeming qualities to it, but it is a little bit dated, and I think in light of some of the later scholarship and, and reinterpretation, some of the conclusions that Leupold draws are a little bit different than the prevailing opinions, especially among Lutheran scholars today. So we've also been uh, relying heavily on this blue book, a uh, very impressive and imposing commentary on the book of Daniel, written by Dr. Andrew Steinman. He is a professor at Concordia University Chicago and has been since the year 2000. Uh, he's probably in our circles, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, the foremost scholar on the Old Testament book of Daniel. And he has what I believe are some helpful uh, thoughts and interpretations for us on chapter 11. We'll try to get through some of those as we go along, uh, dovetailing them with <clears throat> the study guide material, which was largely based on uh, Dr. Leupold's commentary of the previous century. If you are interested in uh, hearing more about the book of Daniel or learning more from Dr. Steinman, I would encourage you to go to the website of our friends at Lutheran Hour Ministries, lhm.org. And you may be aware that by a happy coincidence, this fall, uh, many of the Lutheran Hour radio programs are based on the Old Testament book of Daniel. Pastor Michael Ziegler and others have walked us through this. Uh, in fact, this past weekend, a guest preacher, Pastor Gerard Bowling, uh, delivered the sermon. And again, it was on the book of Daniel. Very fine message from Pastor Bowling, one of our young pastors here in the St. Louis area. In the uh, interview section, again, Dr. Steinman uh, talked with Pastor Michael Ziegler, and they continue to work their way through the book of Daniel. So if you have a chance and you have a few minutes to go back and listen to the previous week's uh, broadcast of the Lutheran Hour program, actually a podcast, again, you can find that material at their website, lhm.org. And don't forget to tune in each week to the Lutheran Hour, now in its 90th year, as they say, of bringing Christ to the nations and the nations to the church. And if anyone at Lutheran Hour is watching, you don't have to send me a check for the commercial. I'm happy to promote it for you uh, because you guys have done such great work for us uh, in sharing Bible study materials uh, for us at Salem. Okay, well, why don't we get into Daniel chapter 11 and we're going to revisit especially this uh, wicked and notorious king named Antiochus Epiphanes. 
Antiochus IV, Roman numeral IV, uh, Epiphanes, and the title is um, imposing in itself for chapter 11. Uh, the theme of this lesson is Proto-Tribulation under Antiochus, a type. Boy, if that doesn't sound like the title of a PhD dissertation, I don't know what does. Let's try to unpack the title a little bit. Proto means early or first, and of course tribulation is trial or trouble, especially for the Christian church or the church of God's people. And then this Antiochus guy, we mentioned he's one of these later Greek rulers. After the time of the Persians, of course, they were done in by Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great died at an early age, and his kingdom was split into four parts. Remember, we had the four horns earlier in Daniel. Uh, down through the years, there was a, a succession of these rulers, most of whom were not very effective and didn't last very long. But uh, one that is uh, important for us is this Antiochus IV Epiphanes because of the uh, dastardly deeds he did in the city of Jerusalem in the temple. Now the last part of the title of chapter 11 is a type, T-Y-P-E. And that's a term that we sometimes use in Bible scholarship. A type is, shall we say, um, a smaller uh, fulfillment of the Word of God that anticipates a greater fulfillment of the Word of God. And a type is usually some sort of a tangible object or a person that you can, that you can hang on to or you can see it's a tangible thing and it looks ahead to something greater that is to come. So sometimes when we talk about biblical prophecy, like we have here in Daniel 11, it's almost like taking a small stone and tossing it into a still pond. And you'll see the ripples go out from where that stone entered the water and get bigger and bigger. I'll try to think of a simple example of this. Uh, I think one that comes to mind is in the book of Numbers, I believe it is, when the children of Israel were in the Sinai desert and uh, they disobeyed God, rebelled against him and against Moses, and God sent those venomous snakes into the camp of the Israelites. And uh, they cried out to God for relief from the snakes. Now remember what God told Moses to do is fashion a bronze serpent and place it on a staff in the middle of the camp. And then whenever, whenever anyone was bitten by a snake, he could look at that bronze serpent on the staff and live. This certainly was an effective remedy. It was a real, tangible solution to this problem by the grace of God. But it is a type in the sense that it anticipates an even greater act of healing and redemption that God would accomplish later in history. Jesus himself referred to this. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone looks, who looks to him uh, should have eternal life. So when you see Jesus raised on the cross, that's what the type, the symbol, or the, I wouldn't say a symbol because it was a real and effective remedy in the Old Testament, that small fulfillment in the bronze serpent looked ahead to the greater fulfillment at the cross where God redeemed uh, all people from sin and death. Now we're going back to chapter 11. So what does it mean when Antiochus is a type? Okay, Antiochus Epiphanes, the wicked Greek king who desecrated the temple in Jerusalem, uh, certainly is guilty of many uh, crimes against the church and crimes against humanity. But he also anticipates a greater wickedness or evil that will be perpetrated upon the people of God, especially toward the end of time, by this character known as the Antichrist. And he's uh, called that, especially in the New Testament. So 
it's a, a little bit challenging to figure out what Daniel 11 is talking about. Is part of Daniel 11 referring to Antiochus himself, or is it referring to the greater evil under Antichrist? The answer is yes. It's a kind of both and, and it's hard to determine uh, which is which. But if you can keep this in the back of your mind as we're going through the lesson, that First and foremost, Daniel uh, saw this vision guided by the, the angel or the divine man we were introduced to in chapter 10. And he was uh, able to see the coming of this king who would create so much havoc for the people of Judea or uh, Israel, you might say, as they return from Persia to rebuild Jerusalem. And yet he also anticipates a much greater evil on the church of God toward the end of time, uh, perpetrated by this figure called the Antichrist. So uh, with that, I probably have you thoroughly confused. Again, Mr. Whitmere and Vicar Brett are in the balcony. If they have anything from you at home, they'll wave their arms and microphones and try to flag me down. And again, uh, don't hesitate to jump in because uh, this was not easy for me to read and I'm going to try to do the best job I can of teaching it in such a way that it makes sense to you. Okay, going to the, uh, the study guide now under introduction, it says in chapter 11, we have a description of what will befall the people of God from the time of Daniel onward. The description takes the form of a symbolic telling of history. The vision stretches from Daniel 11 verse 2 all the way to Daniel 11 verse 45. And it is uh, one of the more detailed descriptions of what will happen in human history uh, between the time of Daniel, which is about 500 years before the birth of Christ, and the first coming of Jesus, uh, during the, the time of Caesar Augustus, the Roman emperor. So there's a lot of detail in here that can be applied to real circumstances in history. If you're of a mind to track all of that down, I can think of no finer place for you to go than to Dr. Steinman's fine commentary on Daniel because uh, the uh, section on chapter 11 is long and detailed. <clears throat> but let's start reading and we're going to find out more about the historical background for what was to come. Now you may recall that verse 1 of chapter 11 actually went with the preceding vision or the preceding section. So even though your Bibles will start at uh, verse 1 of chapter 11, that's from last week's lesson, and it's really a misnumbering of chapter and verse. We talked a little bit about the reasons for that last week. But I think what we'll do is start at verse 2. With the historical background for what is to come, we're going to read verses 2, 3, and 4. Now, I'm reading from the NIV 84 English translation of the Bible. You may have a different version, English Standard Version, King James Version, uh, or other version of the Bible. Follow along. I think you'll be able to keep up, uh, but there's uh, a lot going on here. So let's just take those first three verses. Now then I tell you the truth, three more kings will appear in Persia, and then a fourth, who will be far richer than all the others. When he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. <clears throat> then a mighty king will appear, who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. After he has appeared, his empire will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised, because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. All right, we're going to stop there. Three long verses, but not too difficult if we remember our history. At least this part of it uh, should sound familiar to you. Who is speaking uh, here? When you read in verse 2, Now then, I tell you the truth. This is the same character, either a created angel who appeared to Daniel in chapter 10, or, as uh, Dr. Steinman uh, believes, 
a divine man, the second person of God in his pre-incarnate form, appearing to Daniel in the form of a man and telling him what lies ahead. But it's the same character now speaking to Daniel, continuing his interpretation of this vision. He goes into further detail about what the vision means. And this account is an accurate history of the centuries immediately following Daniel's life. It's quite remarkable because oftentimes when the Bible talks about the rise and fall of empires, it's rather vague <clears throat> and prophetic language is often not that detailed in terms of this happened, then this happened, then this happened. Daniel 11 is extremely well uh, documented and detailed, and you can follow along uh, from uh, ruler to ruler, king to king, right through the chapter. Remember that when Daniel saw this vision, when the angel slash divine man appeared to him, Persia was still the world power. Daniel lived in the kingdom of Persia. He was an older man, and again, he wouldn't live to see many of the things that were revealed to him in this vision. Persia will continue as a world power for some time. Then three more Persian kings of little significance will reign. A fourth king, however, will be the one to watch. He will become wealthy and powerful. His greed will lead to his downfall. Greece will be the power which will defeat him. And again, if you want details on who these kings were and who succeeded whom in the Persian Empire, again, Dr. Steinman's book, you can go online and find um, uh, different websites and scholarship that will show you all of this stuff. I think for the purposes of our study today, we're going to skip over some of those details. But we can't skip over our man Alexander the Great because perhaps no world ruler has ever come closer to being world ruler than Alexander. Uh, the king of Greece, a great hero king, will arise. This king is undoubtedly Alexander the Great. Though he died at an early age, his conquests were remarkable. Because of his untimely death, there was no heir to assume leadership. And after Alexander's death, the kingdom would be split among his four generals. Now, remember those visions in chapter 2, I believe, and chapter 7, if memory serves, about the, the succession of kingdoms. Greece was one of those kingdoms, and then remember the one horn splitting into four. I believe that's the same uh, vision here, or the same interpretation, that Alexander's kingdom is going to be parceled out. And again, if you have any comments or questions about all this, if, if you know something about Alexander the Great that might help fill in the blanks, uh, you can share that with us. Vicar Brett and Mr. Whitmere are in the balcony on Facebook Live. <clears throat> okay. We're going to read a long section next, all the way from verse 5 through verse 35. This is the section that details what we might say is the near-time prophecy, the uh, first fulfillments of this vision, and it covers the time from the end of the Persian Empire down to Antiochus Epiphanes. And I was just going to check in, in Dr. Steinman's book, because I marked the page, what are the dates for Antiochus IV Epiphanes? Because that would be helpful for me. Um, he has that down as Antiochus ruling 174, I'm sorry, 175 to 164 BC. So that's several hundred years after the time of Daniel. Gets us about two centuries before the birth of Jesus. But I think what we'll do is start reading. And uh, why don't we see how we do Again, a lot of this is detailed history, and we're going to skim over much of this and, and focus more of our time on the end of the chapter. <clears throat> so let's pick up at verse 5. The king of the south will become strong, but one of his commanders will become even stronger than he and will rule his own kingdom with great power. After some years, they will become allies. The daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north, to make an alliance, but she will not retain her power, and he and his power will not last. 
In those days she will be handed over together with her royal escort and her father and the one who supported her. One from her family line will arise to take her place. He will attack the forces of the king of the north and enter his fortress. He will fight against them and be victorious. He will also seize their gods, their metal images, and their valuable articles of silver and gold and carry them off to Egypt. For some years he will leave the king of the north alone. Then the king of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south, but will retreat to his own country. His sons will prepare for war and assemble a great army, which will sweep on like an irresistible flood and carry the battle as far as his fortress. Now, I'm going to stop there because it goes on like that all the way to verse 35. And I think um, what you have, you know, if, if you're like me, your eyes kind of glaze over and roll back in your head when you hear about all these kings and queens attacking and defending against each other. Um, let's talk a little bit about the North and the South because it sounds like a kind of civil war and in some ways it is. If we look at our study guide at the beginning of the section under verses 5 to 35, we see the rise of the kings of the North and the South. And I think this at least is something that you may want to remember and it might be helpful. Who are the kings of the North? Who are the kings of the South? After Alexander's death, his kingdom was divided between two generals, Ptolemy, with a silent P, and Seleucus, or Seleucus. Uh, Ptolemy became ruler over Egypt and was known as the king of the south. Now that makes sense, right? Because Egypt is south of the Holy Land, southwest of Persia, certainly south of Greece, across the Mediterranean Sea. Seleucus, or I, I'm sorry, I, I should know how to pronounce that name. I'm going to go with Seleucus because I believe the people who followed Seleucus were called Seleucids. Um, so I'm going to say Seleucus, and if I am wrong, I'm sure someone out there on Facebook will correct me, and my apologies to all who would be offended by my mispronunciation. Seleucus became king over Syria and was known as the king of the north. The battle for control of these two large regions lasted for several hundred years. And again, uh, in reading Dr. Steinman's book, he does a fabulous job of laying out in detail the comings and goings of these two semi-empires, the Seleucids in the north and the Ptolemies in the south. These guys are up in Syria, still a very troubled part of the world today, and the Ptolemies down there in Egypt. And I see Mr. Whitmere waving a hand in the balcony, so I'm not sure if that's good news or bad news, but we will find out what's going on Facebook, Mr. Whitmere. It simply means that we have a comment from Art, so I'm probably going to join you in mispronouncing a name, so also need to apologize ahead of time. And Art's comment is, Darius III was the last of the Archimenids killed by one of his generals. Alexander died after a drinking party with his naval commander, a Necarus, that went on for two days. Some think it was alcohol poisoning. It would not be surprising, as the Macedonians did not dilute their wine with water. Yeah, okay, so that was the end of Alexander the Great, right? Thank you, Vicar Brett and Mr. Whitmere, and thank you, Art, for, uh, he's our resident expert on ancient world history, and uh, I, I wish Art were here today. I would love to have him at my side um, walking us through the kings of the north and the south. But uh, that, that explains how Alexander uh, was no longer on the scene and uh, the circumstances of his death are, are discussed still to this day. But again, remember, uh, after Alexander died, the Greek kingdoms, in effect, uh, in this part of the world, you've got the Seleucids in the north, Syria area, and the Ptolemies in the south, Egypt area. Now, the study guide that we're following continues, and of course, <laughs> You know, if I put my hands here and you envision a world map, here's Syria, here's Egypt, what's in between? 
Well, the Holy Land, the land of the people of Israel, the land where the descendants of people like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego returned after leaving Persia. So not surprisingly, uh, for example, if you think about uh, our American civil war between North and South, where are most of the battlefields? Well, states like Virginia, Tennessee, even Northern Georgia, why? Because that's between the North and the South, that's where all the fighting took place. Um, my home state, Wisconsin, there aren't too many Civil War battlefields in Wisconsin because it was far away from the border. Now, many soldiers did serve uh, faithfully and well for the Union, but uh, there wasn't any fighting uh, that I know of in uh, Wisconsin. Missouri, on the other hand, you know, you're closer to the center of the country, and Missouri was a, a, a state that was divided between North and South. They're kind of right in the crosshairs. And so you can find Civil War sites and battlefields and history all around our part of the world uh, here today. And the same is true with the Holy Land. You've got this period of several hundred years and these two kingdoms, north and south, fighting against each other. Who's going to be in the crosshairs? It's the people of Israel. Sometimes they were controlled by the Ptolemies and other times by the Seleucids. And it says here that the story of these two men is one of intrigue. In other words, the king of the north, the king of the south. Their problems began when a queen set up her sons who were not rightful heirs by killing the real heirs. And again, you can find out more about the details of this uh, in Dr. Steinman's book or other uh, materials. And I see uh, more hands being waved in the balcony and Vicar Brett has a comment or question from home. Another comment from Art that says, Ptolemy hijacked Alexander's body and took it to Egypt, and that Seleucus has a hard C. Seleucus with a hard C. Again, I apologize to all uh, ancient uh, historians who are offended by my mispronunciation. So it would be Seleucid, not Seleucid. And I will try to remember to pronounce that correctly. It's a lonely feeling being up here in the lectern all by yourself with nothing but that camera eye staring you down. I believe we left off at verse 10. Why don't we go back to the Bible, right? That's always a good place to rescue oneself when one is uh, in trouble. So let's go to verse 11. Then the king of the south will march out in a rage and fight against the king of the north, who will raise a large army, but it will be defeated. When the army is carried off, the king of the south will be filled with pride and will slaughter many thousands. Yet he will not remain triumphant. For the king of the north will muster another army, larger than the first, and after several years he will advance with a huge army, fully equipped. In those times many will rise against the king of the south, the violent men among your own people. And again, uh, when it says your own people, this is the divine man or the angel talking to Daniel about the descendants of the Judeans, the Jews, the people who return to Jerusalem or who will return to the Holy Land in the coming decades and centuries. The violent men among your own people, Daniel, will rebel in fulfillment of the vision, but without success. Then the king of the north will come and build up siege ramps and will capture a fortified city. The forces of the south will be powerless to resist. Even their best troops will not have the strength to stand. The invader will do as he pleases. No one will be able to stand against him. He will establish himself in the beautiful land. Now, let's just uh, pause there in verse 16. That beautiful land in the NIV 84 is capitalized, and we've had that phrase before in Daniel. When the beautiful land is referenced, that's the holy land, the land of Palestine or the land of Israel, Judea, the promised land of Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey, where all of this history of God's people again is centered. So again, this invader from the south will establish himself in the beautiful land and will have power to destroy it. We're at verse 17 now. He will determine to come with the might of his entire kingdom and will make an alliance with the king of the south, and he will give him a daughter in marriage in order to overthrow the kingdom, but his plans will not succeed or help him. 
Then he will turn his attention to the coastlands and will take many of them. But a commander will put an end to his insolence and will turn his insolence back upon him. After this, he will turn back toward the fortresses of his own country, but will stumble and fall to be seen no more. Well, let's go back to our study guide and see a couple of paragraphs farther on. Uh, we're going to look at the part of the study guide which begins with the Seleucids held power. The Seleucids held power until the Ptolemies ended up in control through political marriages. Remember, the Ptolemies are in the south. They're in Egypt. If you want to remember a nice little mnemonic device about that, PT, Ptolemy, first two letters of Ptolemy, are also the last two letters of the land of Egypt. So Ptolemies rule in Egypt, right? And they are from the south. Uh, by means of political intrigue, the Seleucids regained control. The Ptolemies were devoted to fine living, but were often inept administrators of their kingdoms. The next king to ascend the throne signals trouble for the Jews. He demands exorbitant taxes. The Jews resist the oppression, Although they are successful in overthrowing the king and the tax collector, they do not gain any power. So that describes what comes next in the text, beginning at verse 20. His successor will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor. In a few years, however, he will be destroyed, and yet not in anger or in battle. He will be succeeded by a contemptible person who has not been given the honor of royalty. He will invade the kingdom when its people feel secure and he will seize it through intrigue. Then an overwhelming army will be swept away before him. Both it and a prince of the covenant will be destroyed. After coming to an agreement with him, he will act deceitfully and with only a few people, he will rise to power. When the richest provinces feel secure, he will invade them and will achieve what neither his fathers nor his forefathers did. He will distribute plunder, loot, and wealth among his followers. He will plot the overthrow of fortresses, but only for a time. With a large army, he will stir up his strength and courage against the king of the south. The king of the south will wage war with a large and very powerful army, but he will not be able to stand because of the plots devised against him. Those who eat from the king's provisions will try to destroy him. His army will be swept away, and many will fall in battle. The two kings, with their hearts bent on evil, will sit at the same table and lie to each other, but to no avail, because an end will still come at the appointed time. The king of the north will return to his own country with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant he will take action against it and then return to his own country. So that gets us up to verse 28. And let's see. Uh, we are talking now about the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. We talked about how the Jews are caught in the crosshairs. And you get the sense now that there is a king of the north who is going to be more powerful than the others. He's mentioned in verse uh, 28. He has great wealth, and his heart will be set against the Holy Covenant. If we go to the study guide, we're going to see that he is identified now as this last Greek king, Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He and the Antichrist, who will be described later in the chapter, cause God's people the most grief. For this reason, Daniel spends more time on them than the other kings. So this is the king who, in verse 21, is labeled as contemptible. He was not a legitimate heir, but usurped the throne while the rightful heir was in a Roman prison. Antiochus oppresses and harasses the people to bring them under his control. And we're going to see more of this as we continue reading in Daniel 10, but here's a preview. When the Jews resist, he goes to Jerusalem in person and murders the high priest. He's notorious for not keeping the treaties he entered with neighboring nations. Unlike the other Seleucid kings, Antiochus takes spoils 
and delights in plundering towns and villages. As Antiochus plotted to overthrow the Ptolemies of Egypt, he was helped by treachery within the Ptolemies' regime. And then we see the most egregious thing that Antiochus did. Antiochus's infamy reached its high point when he desecrated the temple at Jerusalem. He walked into the Holy of Holies and proceeded to splatter the blood of pigs all over the sacred sanctuary. You can imagine how distasteful that would have been, how offensive to the people of God. And Antiochus must have known that what he was doing was especially uh, a stick in the eye at the Jewish people and their God, Yahweh, to come into their temple and to sacrifice pigs at an altar that he had set up, an altar to the uh, Greek god Zeus, and then to splatter the blood of pigs all over the sanctuary. Remember that uh, the high priest would often uh, spray the blood of the lamb that was sacrificed on that curtain in the temple, but now to have pig's blood splattered all over, the blood of these unclean animals. Uh, it was a um, horrific desecration of a place of worship that was sacred and set apart for God's people. So why don't we read now the account of um, Antiochus Epiphanes, and this will be from verse 29 through verse 35. And I, I may have read this, it's hard to remember, I guess I didn't read 29, okay. So at the appointed time, he will invade the south again, but this time the outcome will be different from what it was before. Ships of the western coastlands will oppose him and he will lose heart. Then he will turn back and vent his fury against the Holy Covenant. And I think that's a reference again to taking out his anger on the people of God in Israel. He will return and show favor to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. So there were collaborators, you might say, among the people of God who gave up their worship of Yahweh and went over to uh, serve with Antiochus IV Epiphanes. His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Again, no more sacrifices of lambs and bulls to Yahweh. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. And I believe there's a note here in the NIV 84 Concordia Self-Study Bible under verse 31. It says an altar to the pagan god Zeus Olympias was set up in 168 BC by Antiochus Epiphanes. And Jesus himself used this phrase, the abomination of desolation, the note there is Matthew 24, 15, and Luke 21, 20. So uh, this is a prefiguring of what is to come at the end, at the time of Antichrist. We pick up at verse 32. With flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant, but the people who know their God will firmly resist him. Those who are wise will instruct many, Though for a time they will fall by the sword, or be burned, or captured, or plundered. When they fall, they will receive a little help, and many who are not sincere will join them. Some of the wise will stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end, for it will still come at the appointed time. All right. So we're going to stop there for a moment because we've come to the end of verse 35. Again, if you had any questions or comments about this challenging and difficult chapter of the Bible, uh, please submit them on Facebook Live. We'll try to do our best with them. The point of all of this is to show what is in store for God's people, that under these Greek kings, the people of God can anticipate what does verse 33 say? Falling by the sword, being burned, captured, and plundered. These will not be happy times for the children of God living in Jerusalem and the land of Israel. But the reason that Daniel is given this vision is not only to warn the people what's coming, but to give them hope and to give them comfort. And we're going to see throughout the scriptures how 
evil is always limited by God, and in the end, his good will triumph. I see Mr. Whitmayer waving his hand in the balcony, and he's got a question or comment from home. Indeed, we have a question from Art, who asks, how would the priests of Yahweh reconsecrate the altar and the temple? It seems that there must have been some way to make the temple usable for proper worship. Yeah, that's a great question, Art, and I, I have to confess it's not something I looked at prior to this study. Um, how does one reconsecrate something after it's been desecrated? Um, I don't know. Of course, uh, by the time of Jesus, which was about a century and a half or more after Antiochus Epiphanes, we had our man Herod the Great, and the Romans had replaced the Greeks. Herod the Great um, is a fascinating figure in history. He certainly uh, served at the whims of the Romans, but he was also able to accomplish great things. He wasn't called the Great for nothing. And he was the one, of course, who began rebuilding this great temple in Jerusalem. Now, how they reconsecrated things and set up worship again, uh, we just don't know. But uh, they must have had some sort of purification rite or rededication rite. Um, I'm trying to think in our own day if you could compare it to something. I know that, uh, of course, during the Second World War, so many Christian churches were destroyed by bombs and fire and fighting in Europe and in uh, the United Kingdom and Britain. And uh, many of those were rebuilt, some rebuilt to original specifications, some rebuilt in totally different architectural styles. And there must have been uh, rites of rededication or recommitment to the Lord or purification for a facility that had been destroyed and rebuilt. In our part of the world, um, you may recall a few years ago when the ceiling fell in at our uh, sister congregation, Emmanuel Lutheran Church in St. Charles. Thankfully, no one was hurt by that, but they had half the ceiling inside the church fall on the pews. And by God's grace, that has been repaired. And I, I'm sure that uh, the folks at Emmanuel had some kind of a rededication uh, service to uh, reopen their sanctuary when those repairs were complete. So I'm, I'm guessing that's what they would have done. And I don't exactly know uh, how they would have done it. So if anybody out there is an Old Testament or intertestamental scholar, uh, please let us know. All right, we're going to move on and leave behind the tangled web of history of the Seleucid and Ptolemy kingdoms. And now we're going to jump ahead. Uh, we're going to exercise the conclusions based on our presuppositions that the rest of this chapter now no longer speaks of Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Critical scholars will often apply the rest of the chapter also to this Greek king, but most uh, more conservative Bible scholars, including Lutheran scholars now, say that what follows in chapter 11 applies to the coming of the Antichrist, this figure who will arise prior to the end of the world and make life so difficult for the people of God. Let's see if we can uh, not only identify what happens when Antichrist comes, but how he might be distinguished from some of the things that happened uh, during Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, let's read, for example, the opening part of the study guide under verses 36 to 45. The final 10 verses of Daniel chapter 11 are often interpreted as referring to Antiochus. Our commentators, however, take the position that these verses refer to the Antichrist. This is because the details given do not fit any acts committed by Antiochus. In other words, Antiochus was a bad guy uh, seen from the perspective of God's people, but he didn't do all the things that are described here in the last verses. So I think what we'll do next is read. Let's read all the way from verse 36 to the end of the chapter, two paragraphs that describe this character. And the title in, uh, or the heading that the NIV editors insert before verse 36 is the king who exalts himself. Now, 
this gets very confusing. But again, there is reference to the king of the south and the king of the north in verse 40. And uh, there is not an agreement on who these kings are. We had king of the north and king of the south in the first part of the chapter. The uh, Lutheran scholars say this is probably a different king of the north and the south, and one of them is this antichrist figure himself. So just to make it more confusing, you have the same terminology referring to different kings. But why don't we go to verse 36 and start reading through the end of the chapter. The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. And of course, that would be the one true god himself. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed, for what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but he will exalt himself above them all. Instead of them, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god unknown to his fathers he will honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He will attack the mighty fortresses with the help of a foreign god and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. At the time of the end, the king of the south will engage him in battle, and the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and a great fleet of ships. He will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from his hand. He will extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. He will gain control of the treasures of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt with the Libyans and Nubians in submission. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him, and he will set out in a great way rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end, and no one will help him. Now, to cut to the chase again, that last sentence is critical for us as Christians in the 21st century as we anticipate the coming end of the world with all of the destruction and all of the mayhem that lies ahead for the church, for the world, for God's people. Remember that behind it all, our Lord God is working all things together for the eternal good of those called according to his purpose in Christ. He will come to an end, and no one will help him. God will bring this Antichrist to an end. Well, we can't leave chapter 11 of uh, Daniel without talking about the way that Lutheran scholars and leaders at the time of the Reformation applied the words of Daniel 11, 36 to 45, to the Roman papacy and referred to the office of the papacy as Antichrist. Now, I have a lot of material in the study guide on this. Our time is running short. I'll try to go through this uh, quickly, uh, but Luther, in writing the treatise on the power of the primacy of the Pope, one of the Lutheran confessions that's included in the Book of Concord, wrote uh, these four lines about the Roman pontiff, who is the papacy, and uh, he says the pontiff claims for himself that by divine right he is supreme above all bishops and pastors in all Christendom. Secondly, he adds also that by divine right he has both swords, that is, the authority of bestowing kingdoms, enthroning and deposing kings, regulating secular dominions, etc. In other words, the Roman Pope uh, was intended to be a uh, religious and sacred ruler, but he was exercising his authority in what we call God's left-hand kingdom, running governments and society, which was not uh, what he was called to do, said the Lutherans. And thirdly, he says that to believe this is necessary for salvation. And for these reasons, the Roman bishop calls himself and boasts that he is the vicar of Christ on earth. 
In other words, he is the divinely chosen instrument, the kind of gatekeeper to our Lord Jesus and the kingdom of heaven. And then Luther, Luther said, these three articles we hold to be false, godless, tyrannical, and quite pernicious to the church. So this quotation reflects the Lutheran position that the office of the papacy is an office of the Antichrist. And the following paragraphs continue that line of reasoning in the Lutheran confessions. Now you, th you look at some of the words that are included in the end of Daniel chapter 11. I think before we go any farther, it's important to remember that the Lutherans who said these things were not uh, anti-Catholic bigots as has been the case throughout history, uh, at least since the time of the Reformation. Remember, they did not want to leave the Catholic Church of the day. They wanted a genuine and sincere reform. They were concerned that their leaders were misleading the people of God. They never objected to having a bishop in Rome or having bishops in general. They were concerned about the misuse of the office that the papacy uh, had been intended to serve, uh, exercising authority in society and in government that they believe rightly belonged to princes and secular rulers. So when the, uh, the Lutherans referred to the office of the papacy as the Antichrist, it's because in New Testament passages about the Antichrist, he is depicted as someone who has an office within the church, but then uses that office to oppress God's people and misuse his authority in society in general. Remember the problem with Antiochus Epiphanes was he was a secular king who had come and exercised influence in the church, desecrating the temple. The Antichrist is different. He's a spiritual or church leader who begins exercising authority in government and society. And at the time of the Middle Ages, at the time of Luther, this was certainly the case. The Lutherans were not the first to call for reforms within the papacy. Uh, this had been going on for a couple of hundred years beforehand. So if you look at the next paragraphs that I have in this study guide, uh, it reminds us of why the Lutheran position would be that the office of the papacy is an office of the Antichrist. The king has no regard for the gods of his fathers. And I won't read all of these. I think I'm going to skip down. You can look at them on screen if you'd like. The having no regard for the desire of women also fits the papacy. Remember at the time of the Middle Ages, uh, clerics in the Roman Catholic Church were not permitted to marry. The insistence on the celibacy of the clergy uh, is evidence Lutherans use that the king spoken of in this prophecy is the papacy or the pope. And um, I think if you look at history from outside the Catholic Church, there are many who would say that insisting on clerical celibacy has created great strife and great trouble for God's people and for the church itself in those centuries. Uh, this king has no regard for any gods and exalts himself above anything. While this could fit any man or group, Lutherans saw this passage especially applying to the papacy. So then the king worships a god of his own making. Uh, they talked about, for example, the veneration and even the worship of the saints, uh, which the scriptures ex expressly forbid, you shall have no other gods. The next description is of the king worshiping a god of warfare, that the king uses warfare and oppression to silence his opponents. Luther and his compatriots were familiar with that. There was a lot of warfare in Europe between the forces of the Protestants or Lutherans and the forces loyal to the Catholic Church. Uh, there are uh, differences, as I said. He is attacked by both the kings of the north and the south. Now this study guide is presuming that there's the king of the north, the king of the south, and then this third king. Dr. Steinman's contention is that the king of the north in these verses is the papacy itself. But we are told that Antichrist will enter into the church, gaining power and riches greater than any other government has ever known, and by doing so the Antichrist will deceive good people. 
finally the king will hear rumors from the east and the west and go on a rampage trying to suppress all who stand in his way. Uh, he will pitch his tent between the Mediterranean and Mount Zion. That's the Holy Land. He will make an assault on the church, but when he does this, he will be doomed. Well, let's wrap up this interpretation with this paragraph. Whether Daniel 11 speaks of the office of the Roman papacy or any other office the Antichrist may devise, the end of this king shows that God's people ultimately will inherit the earth, as Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, and overcome evil people. So the real comfort in chapter 11, I mean, we've had a lot of stuff, but that last line about the Antichrist, he will come to his end and no one will help him, reminds us that our Lord God will bring the forces of evil to an end. And one more thing before we leave, I know it's hard because we don't get a chance for feedback on these video studies, but again, I want to be clear about what Lutherans have said and have not said about the Roman papacy and the Pope. Uh, Dr. Steinman is careful to point this out in, a, in an excursus in his commentary. The Lutherans have never identified a particular pope as being the Antichrist. So in other words, we would not say, for example, that Pope Francis or Pope Benedict or Pope John Paul II is the Antichrist. But it's more an interpretation that this office, as it has been carried out in the history of the church, has been anti-Christian in the sense of serving all of these purposes that were laid out in this study guide. Dr. Steinman is careful to point out, and I would repeat, that the Roman Catholic Church is filled with many believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, as are all Christian churches, and we are saved by belonging to Christ and not belonging to or not belonging to a visible church body or congregation. And certainly, uh, there are Christians, Christian men, who have served in the office of the papacy and who still do so, who will certainly be redeemed by Christ and will be in heaven with us forever. And we rejoice in that. So please don't go away um, with anything less than that conclusion as we wrap up our study today. Okay, well, speaking of conclusion, we are coming to the end. The end is actually twofold. We've reached our end of the study of the book of Daniel, and we reach the end of all things as we get to verse 45. But there is one more little chapter in 12, and that's an interesting one as well. The 12th chapter of Daniel will tell us some of the things that are to come between today and the final day of our world's existence. It will give us some information about the final judgment to come. And I would submit that chapter 12 is going to be a little more interesting and a little bit easier, perhaps, than chapter 11. So I hope that you come back and join us for one more session on the Old Testament book of Daniel next Tuesday morning. Since it will be the last week of the Christian church year, what an appropriate time to talk about the end times as we learn how God is going to bring all things to their conclusion according to his eternal plan and bring his people to everlasting life through the redeeming work of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, I want to thank Mr. John Whitmayer and Vicar Brett Jones for being with me this morning and for fielding comments and questions from you. I want to thank you on Facebook Live and on the telephone ministry for joining us. We will uh, let uh, you know as to whether there is any change in our scheduling in terms of in-person or not in-person Bible study. Uh, we're taking things one day and one week at a time. All I can urge you to do is continue to seek out our website, slcas.org, and there you can find the latest information on everything that's happening at Salem. With that, let's close with the benediction of our Lord, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me again this morning. We'll see you back here next time.